ministers, uh, ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Salam alaikum. What a powerful speech by the president. Uh, I was so moved in particular by his promise that he will spend his last three years as the president uh, in putting the conservation of the rainforest at the top of the agenda. That is a very powerful promise. Uh, and it, uh, I think it moved uh, us all. Let me promise that uh, Norway will be with Indonesia in this regard. Uh, we are not similar to Indonesia, to the country we are very different, but we will do our best to make certain that the president can deliver upon his promise. While the color of Indonesia, at least the nature of Indonesia, may be green, uh, the color of Norwegian nature may be white, and this is a year where we, back, no back home in Norway, is celebrating our Arctic heroes. Because in three months' time, it's the 100 years anniversary uh, for the time when a Norwegian, Roald Amundsen, was the first to reach the South Pole in 1911. We are also celebrating this year another great Norwegian, Fritjof Nansen, one of our national heroes. Sorry to disturb you with, with some Norwegian names. Uh, but the, this, uh, this man in the 1890s, he left everything to try to reach to the North Pole, going into the Arctic wilderness, into the white uh, uh, neighborhood, into the cold, trying to find this place. He went with one companion and a num number of dogs. Uh, these were very different days from today. They slept in the same sleeping bag to keep it warm. Uh, it was very formal days. They spoke to each other as Mr. Nansen and Mr. Johansen. Just after half a year in the same sleeping bag, bag they started using first names. <laughs> what I want to evoke of today is the spirit to be brave, not to sit down discussing every difficulty with what you want to do, but simply to set the target to reach to the South Pole, to reach to the North Pole, to be brave, to be dedicated, to prove leadership. Because these are exactly the qualities we need of our time. Let's be frank to each other. There, we have huge difficulties reaching a global agreement on climate uh, change. We are building the ho house step by step, making great strides in Cancun, Mexico last year probably, hopefully, making new strides in South Africa this year, but we will not reach the global encompassing agreement this year. However, what we do is that a huge number of nations are doing their homework. China uh, is improving techno technology in this field every day. Australia is now embarking upon a, a national system uh, for climate uh, carbon uh, uh, quotas. Uh, Germany has decided to phase out nuclear technology, but that means that they will use a, a huge effort uh, to improve the uh, renewable energies. Brazil and Indonesia defending and protecting and conserving their forests. These are the bottom-up initiatives we need to complement uh, the top-down initiatives of a global uh, climate uh, agreement. But all these initiatives call for leadership. There is no way they can happen without national leaders taking the platform to provide leadership. And that's why I'm also so moved by the leadership showed by Indonesia, and in particular President Yudhono, yesterday outlining the strategy for Indonesia to reach its cli climate uh, uh, emission targets, setting up the agency or the task force under uh, Minister Kunturo, uh, embarking upon a moratorium on uh, forestry concessions. Yes, the moratorium may not have been what, exactly what everyone uh, wanted, but still it was a huge step in the right direction. Uh, then dedicating a pilot province in central Kalimantan uh, and taking step by step Indonesia in the right direction. The president himself 
spoke about his conversation with his granddaughter today. I remember the great German statesman Bismarck, who was once asked, what, what is the difference between simply a politician and a statesman? And he said, a statesman is a politician who is thinking of his grandchildren. <laughs> exactly what President Yudono did uh, today. On the part of Norway, we are very privileged to work with so many great Indonesians. Last week in New York, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Marty, with myself and others, opened a seminar, lots of people around, uh, a very great support from the global community for the efforts of Indonesia in the area of rainforest. Working with Minister Kunturo, who has proven himself in Archer. Last year I visited Archer around the five years anniversary uh, for the uh, tsunami. And let me tell you, many of you may have been there, but this is absolutely remarkable from any international standard. 200,000 people were killed in Archer, but the reconstruction of Archer, compared to any other reconstruction anywhere in the world, is simply marvelous, and people there are so grateful to you, uh, Pakuntoro, but also to, of course, all the others, the president and others who contributed uh, to this. Let me also uh, mention we had a very good meeting yesterday with Minister Sulkifli, the Minister of Forestry, and he has done his part by making the, uh, the map of the Indonesian uh, forest, the one map system, which is now transparent. So starting from the very top with the president, but with all these ministers, and coming down to the local level, Indonesia is dedicated to this great task, and the international community will stand by you. We know it will not be easy. We know it will be a long uh, road, but we will go that road uh, with, uh, with you, because it's responding to the main issues of the time. Uh, I think I'm basically speaking to the converted here. But let me still recall that there are three main reasons to conserve and make a system for sustainable use of the rainforest in Indonesia and everywhere else. 15, number one, 15 to 20 percent of all global climate gas emissions originate from deforestation. Unless we can bring that substantially down, there is no way we can globally combat climate change. Secondly, the rainforest of the world is the biggest source of biodiversity anywhere on the globe. Some scientists believe that we are now embarking upon an, uh, an eradication of, of species unprecedented in modern times, maybe even similar to what happened when the dinosaurs died out 64 million years back in time. Then it was completely natural. Today it's man-made on the top of natural uh, vari variations. Uh, to protect the biodiversity of Indonesia and any other place is a great, great cause. And let me just make one symbol, and the president spoke about the tigers, about the orangutans, uh, about all the birds and all, all, all the plants. But last year in Papua, uh, there was also a sensation. A new mammal was discovered. I mean, discovering new parasites or, or new small insects, that's uh, that some scientists are doing more or less on a daily basis. But discovering new mammals, that is very, very rare indeed. But it, it happened here. It was the long-beaked echidna, small, cute animal, but a new one. So it's a symbol also of the great biodiversity of the Indonesian archipelago. So adding to climate change, adding to biodiversity, of course we want to provide a better livelihood for millions of people living in the forest. Then comes, I think, the real issue, because no one was really opposed to conserving the forest. But some people will ask, can we conserve the forest and continue with 6 to 7 percent economic growth at the same time? Or to put it in another way, can conservation of forest be good for business? And I think the answer is very clearly yes and yes indeed. There are a couple of reasons why conservation of forest and sustainable use of forest 
are good for business. One is of course predictability. There is no way there can be predictability while you are destroying the source of your income at the same time. So predictability relies upon a conservation and sustainable use uh, of the forest. Second, uh, it will be good for business uh, because you will be much closer to the demands of the global marketplace. Consumers will in the long run simply not accept products which comes from uh, uh, destroying uh, the source uh, of, of, of the product or, the, or, or, or uh, destroying, destroying the environment. And all the big companies working in the global market are feeling this pressure. They want to be responsible because consumers demand responsibility and also because, of course, they want their employees to be proud of the business. If you want to recruit good people these day, days in the global marketplace, you must create a company where people are proud of working for, uh, for, for your company, and that's much more easy if you are environmentally uh, friendly. Adding to this, there will be money available through the red schemes. Norway has provided a promise of one billion uh, US dollars for this, but other, other nations, the UK and Australia and many others are also providing money in different, in different ways. And combined, this will also be uh, a huge source of income for business in changing uh, their uh, behavior into environmentally phrase, uh, friendly ways of, of, of doing it. It can be done in so many different ways. Uh, the uh, the um, productivity of agriculture and forestry can be increased. Degraded land can be taken into, uh, into use. Uh, in industries can be done in a way which is not harming the forest. Uh, tourism is a huge source of income. It's tourism is the biggest uh, new uh, industry in the, in, or the most rapidly increasing industry in the entire world. So there are many, so many ways of uh, getting an income from the forestry, from the forest, while not uh, destroying it. And then the ultimate answer. Some people will say this man from Norway is a, uh, he is a, read a lot of theory, but he cannot implement this in, in real life. But there is a nation which has proven that all this can be implemented in real life. And ladies and gentlemen, that, that nation you are on the way of, to do it in Indonesia, but that nation is Brazil. And Brazil with Indonesia is the biggest rainforest nation in the world. In the last seven years, Brazil has reduced its deforestation rate with 70%, while at the same time being a prime target of business investment because they have a business-friendly investment climate while at the same time embarking upon one of the most well-known schemes for reducing poverty in the entire world, the so-called Bolsa Familia. So Brazil has shown that you can take care of the environment, of business, and of poor people at the same time. When President Lula left office after, seven year, or after eight years, he had an 86% approval rate. My friend Jim, what a dream for UK or Norwegian politicians to have 86% approval rate when you leave office. Normally, we are close to zero when we, when we leave, uh, when we leave uh, office. Uh, and of course, because this policy was so successful. And if I had gone to Brazil eight years back and told the Brazilians that you could manage to do this, of course, you would have been kicked out as some, as some maverick from maybe some non-governmental organization really not understanding economics. The Brazilians have not done it for anyone else. The Brazilians have done it for Brazil. And they've got support from the international community to do it, but they have devised the ways of doing it exactly in the same manner as the president, Mr. Contoro, and others will devise the methods for doing it in Indonesia. We are here to support, not to lead. Uh, you will lead, but we will gather behind you. Finally, again, we have not decided to support Indonesia in this endeavor because we believe it will be easy. We have not decided to support you because we believe that there will be no counter forces. We have decided to be behind Indonesia in this uh, uh, issue for one simple reason. It's so important.
Thank you.